Hello all, welcome to the show. I'm Gus Gagliardi and this is Fire Code Tech. On Fire Code Tech, we interview fire protection professionals from all different careers and backgrounds in order to provide insight and a resource for those in the field. My goal is to help you become a more informed fire protection professional. Fire Code Tech has interviews with engineers and researchers, fire marshals, and insurance professionals, and highlights topics like codes and standards, engineering systems, professional development, and trending topics in the industry. So if you're someone who wants to know more about fire protection or the fascinating stories of those who are in the field, you're in the right place. Welcome to episode 11 of Fire Code Tech. Today we have Bill Gustin. Bill is a 47-year veteran of the fire service and a captain of the Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department. He began his fire service career in Chicago area and is a lead instructor in his department's officer development program. In this episode of Fire Code Tech, we talk with Bill about his mission to join the gap between fire suppression and protection professionals and the fire service. Bill presents a stark contrast between natural materials in legacy homes and legacy construction as opposed to the new and advanced lightweight construction and plastics that are found in commercial and residential occupancies everywhere today. Bill is an absolute fire hose of information about the fire service. If you have any interest in learning more about the interface point between fire protection and the fire service, you're going to love this episode. I hope you enjoy the show, and don't forget to subscribe and like us on social media. Let's dive in. Well, hello, Bill. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for the invitation, Gus. Well, I just wanted to get started with a little bit about your background, Bill, and how you got into the fire service. I didn't know if you could speak on that a little bit. Sure, I could. I was blessed. Uh, My father was a fireman's fireman, Uh, a good family man, a World War II South Pacific veteran, uh, but also a fireman's fireman. Entered the Chicago Fire Department in 1948, and he instilled in me certain values that made me a student of the fire service very early in my life. I was fascinated with it. And when I was in grade school, I was reading some of his reference or study material that he was using to study for the captain's exam. And uh, it's one of the books I remember was called the Ohio Manual. And it was basically basic overall uh, fire prevention, fire behavior. I mean, this is like late 1950s vintage material. But I was fascinated as a young age, and uh, I I grew up in a small town outside of Chicago. And uh, every time that siren would would uh, would blow for the volunteer fire department, I would uh, run to the fire station, and I felt like I was a part of it at a very early age. So that's basically how I got started because of, because of my dad. That's awesome. Very interesting. Sorry, you were going to go on. I've had a a lot of blessings in my life. The uh, area that I grew up in, the suburbs of Chicago, had a uh, community college, College of DuPage, that had, and they were just starting out, just starting out in the early 70s. And I didn't realize how good the two-year fire science program was until much later in life, how they get it. I still look at my notes that I rewrote, that's how I would study, from 72, 73, 74. I cannot believe how spot on these instructors were about alarm systems, uh, suppression systems, building construction, all things that uh, at the time we didn't know why it was important to become a lifelong student of fire suppression systems, detection systems, and building construction. Well, before you can teach, you have to motivate. Well, these instructors were motivators and they, uh, They instilled in me the desire and the knowledge that uh, we need to know about these things because they're basically dry subjects. Understand that firefighters, people involved in fire suppression, are are, are adrenaline junkies, and they tend to find codes, uh, details of uh, construction, uh, prolonged reading of uh, technical dry material, pretty boring. What in fact, it's a necessity. And uh, now I will tell you this, uh, and this also made a big impression on me. As I said, my dad was a fireman's fireman. 
when he was on squad two in the Skid Row section west of downtown Chicago, they had the greatest loss of life per square mile area for fires of any industrialized country in the United States or uh, 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 in the world, in the world. And, but when he made Lieutenant, he went right into the fire prevention bureau. That's what you did. And he told me he hated it. He was in there almost two years, but in retrospect, it made him a much, much better fire officer. Well, how, do, how does fire prevention relate to fire suppression? It's got everything to do with fire suppression. How do you know how far your stairways are apart? How far your standpipe outlets are? The construction of a building, suppression system. Do you know the difference between a fire alarm, a supervisory signal, and a trouble alarm? There's a vast number of fire suppression folks out there that don't know how to decipher what they're looking at on a fire alarm control panel. Where do they learn that? In the state curriculums. Most states become a certified firefighter. There is very little about suppression systems, alarm systems, and fire codes in that curriculum. It's mostly ropes and knots, of course, heavy, of course, into emergency medical services, extrication, of course, you know, with the jaws of life, search and rescue, hydraulics, building systems, very, very, very little. That's very interesting. I like hearing you talk about your your background and it's it's fascinating to me I can tell from watching your instructional videos online that you have a very good grasp of fire science um, I was watching a video you sent me yesterday and you were talking about you know the off-gassing uh, element of the fire and how that you can't extinguish a fire without you know cooling these basically heated gases from the fuel and it was just clear to me that not only you know do you have great experience in firefighting but you have a really strong knowledge of fire science so that's really fascinating i do and you know i am i bragging yes i am bragging but it's been my lifelong work and i've spent my whole life doing this you know fire is a gaseous phenomenon uh, it has to be the fuels have to be vaporized in order to burn and I've experienced this. If you don't think fire is a gaseous phenomenon, just take a look and see what happened in Los Angeles over the weekend. It's a gaseous phenomenon. And uh, solids have to uh, thermally decompose, py uh, pyrolyze. And uh, in our petrochemical environment today, see, I'm an old bull here. Now, I was a firefighter in the early 70s, early, early 70s. And we didn't even wear a breathing apparatus. We could put out a room and contents fire without a breathing apparatus, without a hood, a Nomex hood or a BBI hood, with gardener gloves, with a 65-gallon-a-minute nozzle with an inch-and-a-half hose line. Why? Because back then, just about everything in a, in a household was a naturally occurring material, wool, wood, cotton. And, but today, just think in your lifetime. I don't know how old you are, uh, Gus, but uh, I know I'm older than you. I'm probably the oldest guy in the room right now. But even <laughs> in your lifetime, Gus, think of how many things that used to be made out of metal are now made out of plastic. The whole environment has changed. When you take a look at that underwriter's laboratory side-by-side -side, uh, comparison of uh, the legacy, uh, like the 1960s, 70s living room, uh, versus the modern furnishings of today, which are basically polyester, polyvinyl chloride, polyurethane foam, where the time for flashover years ago with naturally occurring materials was like 24 minutes. Today, less than three or four, four minutes. The whole thing has changed. It used to be that you could have a small volunteer fire department, have a, a, a fire in your house, and let's say it takes them 20 minutes to get there at best. The fire is still basically in the incipient phase. Today, no. It's post-flashover, and in many cases, because of the building being closed up, it's ventilation limited, oxygen deprived. In other words, the fire reached a crescendo, but then it ate up the available oxygen, 
because petrochemical base material, in order for it to be converted into energy, has to unite with oxygen. Well, the amount of oxygen released or uh, the energy released has to be dependent upon, do you have enough oxygen? Well, very quickly, fires in today's structures, which have never been tighter in terms of energy efficiency, well, uh, weather tinting or uh, weather stripping and uh, thermal pane windows, the fire reaches a ventilation limited or an oxygen deprived state very quickly to the point where there might not be anything showing in terms of smoke pushing out of that building. Because why? Because the fire is diminished in intensity. And when it diminished in intensity, it diminished in temperature. And what's forcing the smoke out of a building is the pressure differential based upon the, the temperature. So it is not uncommon today for fire apparatus to pull up on uh, any type of structure and have nothing showing. But on closer examination, you got a dragon sleeping inside that building, just waiting for a good gulp of oxygen. That's terrifying. That's really remarkable how the just uh, more common use of plastics and materials with petrochemicals of them has created such a dramatic difference in, you know, the response time for fires and just everything involved around the fire service for all occupancies, really, not just residential, but... Oh, yeah, Gus, Gus, look at your business. You take a warehouse. We stored paper plates and paper cups. All right, and then we stop and we start storing styrofoam plates and cups. Will that sprinkler system deliver enough discharge density, gallons per minute per square foot, to cover the different commodity class? Nope. No, it won't, brother. And that is a huge problem. You know, any firefighter that looks at a building and says, ah, don't worry about that building. We'll never, we'll never, we'll never have a serious fire in that Walmart or that Home Depot. Uh, never. Because a sprinkler has never fought a nasty, dirty, rotten, soaking, wet, smoky, dangerous, toxic fire in a sprinkler building. Now, sprinklers have an incredible success rate, suppression rate. And you know there's never been a multiple loss of life in a fully sprinklered building. But it does not completely eliminate the problem because the problem is not the fire, of course, it's the toxic gases. Definitely. That's all really fascinating stuff. So I just wanted to uh, give the people a little bit more background on your uh, work history and some of the roles you've had up till now. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about some more of your history in the fire service and uh, I know you started out in Chicago and then uh, made some transitions, but yeah, I didn't know if you could go over that a little bit more. I was never on the Chicago Fire Department, as I said, my dad was, but as a uh, starting at about 14 years old, uh, they were pretty lax with uh, you riding as a fire buff, and uh, I could, they would let me go as far as I could go and take the smoke. Uh, I mean, that's basically what it was. The movie Backdraft is so unrealistic except for one scene. And that is the very first scene where the little kid is picking out a, a helmet and boots uh, and a coat to uh, ride the fire apparatus with his dad. And uh, that was my experience at a very young age. And man, once you catch that, you never lose it. You, you never lose it. I mean, I still have the same passion. I don't go to fires anymore, Gus. I'm 65 years old. Nobody told me I was too old. I told myself I was too old. It is a physically fit person's job, and I felt that uh, I could not reach my standards anymore, so I don't. But when I first started out, uh, I was a paid on call, which is a volunteer that gets paid to go to drills and fires, firefighter in Wheaton, Illinois. And I, they gave me a part-time job of a fire inspector. I mean, I'm just a kid now. You know, I'm going to the community college, and I'm making inspections. So at a very early age, I'm drawing up plot plans, plans of buildings, studying the code. And, and the, the town I grew up in, Gus, is Main Street, USA, all over this country. There are pictures of our downtown area uh, in the 1800s when there were horses uh, pulling wagons down the street. Same buildings. 
same buildings. And I fought fires in those buildings in the 70s. Uh, the, the buildings are still there. And, uh, but my knowledge of building construction, it was like a living laboratory for me to uh, be able to see, actually see buildings. One, they were very proactive. They knew that they couldn't change the world. But one thing that they did that was very, very smart is they required every downtown business to install sprinklers in their basement because they knew there's no way, no stopping a basement fire. There's no stopping a basement fire. And Gus, as we were saying before, uh, we got online with our audience. Uh, it takes tragedies to uh, affect change in the field of fire protection. Uh, if you are in the fire protection business, whether suppression, prevention, fire protection engineer, there are just certain landmark fires that you need to know that made a huge change in, for the better, the Coconut Grove uh, nightclub fire, which was a basement occupancy uh, right after World War II, the 23rd Street collapse, 23rd Street and Broadway, where they had actually extended the walls of the boundaries of one of an art studio underneath the wonder drugs on uh, 23rd street and, and what do we learn how much fire you can have underneath you and in many cases like wall bombs in new york city how much fire you can have over your head and not know it i experienced some things at a very young age that have just stuck with me my whole life. In September of 1973, we went, we were at a volunt we were at a meeting, you know, paid on calls, you know, call them volunteers. And we had a, a call for a fire at a drugstore that was adjacent with a party wall to a grocery store. We went in there, it was a little bit of light, wispy gray smoke. As we advanced an inch and a half line, thinking that we had a fire in the storage area, about 200 feet deep into the building, we saw a bluish, orange flame blow out of one of the uh, air registers, HVAC registers. We did not know that this building had a bowstring truss roof, had a tin ceiling, and the fire was roaring, roaring in that truss loft, and we didn't know it. And thank God we were not successful in pulling that ceiling, because had we been successful, it would have been like opening up the damper of a wood-burning stove. So we got out of there, and within minutes, the entire roof collapsed. It would have killed about 20 of us at a very early age, very early age, bowstring trust. Those are some hard lessons to learn. Well, yeah. That's some very interesting things. You know, Gus, I, I experienced that. I feel that I have a, a moral and professional obligation not to be silent about these things. I mean, you may go your whole career and never have a fire in the truss loft of a bowstring truss building. There's very few of them left, but I need to pass that on. You can't go to every fire. You can't learn while you burn. I remember mentioning to my dad when I was taking these fire science classes, dad, you know, I can't, you know, I like studying this, but man, I can't wait till I get on the Chicago fire department. And uh, I, I don't have to study this anymore. I'll be able to learn it firsthand. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Bill. Do you think you can learn everything you can by going to fires? You won't go to enough fires. And believe me, you don't want to go to every fire because you'll find yourself going to fires you wish you never went to. Fires where people are killed, kids are killed. <laughs> God, was he right. And then he added, anyway, Bill, I know firemen that go to two to three working fires a day, and they're some of the dumbest bastards I know. So just because you're going to a lot of fires, if you're not astute, you're not paying attention, you're not going to learn from them. You can go to 10 fires, or you can go to one fire 10 times and study every. And especially, man, do you learn from the ones you made a mistake on. Whew. That's where you learn. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's a good comment on any profession. Just because you do a lot of work doesn't mean you're good at it or... Just because you, when you make a mistake in your career is when you have the biggest lessons learned. So yeah, that's good stuff. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it's, it could come as a price. Uh, I, God bless me. I was very lucky uh, that uh, I've experienced. I, uh, we had a fire in a, uh, a high school library, completely windowless in uh, 1980. And 
it, now, now that I think back on it and I look at the uh, research and fire dynamics done by NIST and Underwriters Laboratory, it was the classic ventilation limited fire. And that revised time temperature curve is, in a sense, deceivingly dangerous because it gives you the impression that when you make an opening, like opening a door to advance a hose line into a oxygen deficient fire, that the fire immediately roars back to life. Negative. Negative. It could take from 100 to 200 seconds for enough oxygen to flow in and mix with the uh, pyrolyzed products of combustion, the fire gases. Well, you can get pretty deep inside a fire area in 100 to 200 seconds. And that's what happened to me, Gus, is we got in there and there was uh, it was in a smoldering state. The uh, vandals had taken books and piled them high and set them on fire. We forced the door. We went in. It was like smoldering. It looked like a smoldering campfire. And within oh, maybe 30 seconds, it started to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now that I think back on it, it was exactly what we study with these ventilation limited or ventilation controlled fires. Back then, we didn't have Nomex hoods. I ended up, a bunch of us did, terrible burns. Uh, it was your neck, your ears, blisters on your ears. Did I panic? Yeah, I panicked. Yeah, when you're on fire, you panic. But I, I do know now. Now, of course, that uh, school has been rebuilt and it's sprinkled. I'm trying to teach our firefighters. Is there a difference with different occupancy? You're damn right there is. You get a listen, dollar stores and discount auto parts. We got one on every corner. They're under 25,000 square feet. Why? Under the threshold where they would require sprinklers. Now, you get a fire and there's very few external openings. You get a fire in one of those places. In the middle of the night, you got a sleeping dragon in there, man. Closed up commercial structure like that, fire is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Now, let's say that you're in an authority having jurisdiction that requires sprinklers. There is absolutely no question about what we're going to do. We are going to connect up to a good source of water, run two, three-inch lines into the fire department connection and pump that, if it's a new building, to 150 PSI. We, the fire, the sprinklers are already on the scene. But a lot of, again, uh, people think, well, you know, it's a sprinkler building. A lot of people don't realize how limited sprinklers can be because of the, uh, uh, the commodity that they're trying to protect, uh, because of the water pressure. Also, uh, you know, Gus, that there's a, the sprinkler system is predicated on uh, what, four or five heads operating max? Well, what happens when you get that aerosol can and it shoots across the store and now you've got two fires or you've got a flammable liquid spill and you've got 10, 12 heads go off and the building doesn't have a fire pump? Well, you better be the fire pump. You better get there with your 1,500 gallon a minute fire apparatus, connect up to the fire department connection, and you're the building's fire pump. And then make sure all the valves are open. That's really interesting to hear you talking about uh, cooking up to the fire department connection. I always wonder what kind of, what's the approach when you get to a building that's sprinklered and, you know, when is it advantageous to hook up to the automatic sprinkler system? Do you always hook up to the automatic sprinkler system or there are some times where you want to manually fight the fire instead or yeah, that's really interesting. Very few cases. I was very privileged to uh, attend in uh, 2017 or 18, a industrial firefighting school conducted by a uh, factory mutual in Rome, Georgia. And it it's to educate firefighters limitations of sprinkler systems and how we can most effectively utilize them. And one thing that was really resonated with me is they got a couple bales of hay burning. Yeah, gray smoke and uh, smoke maybe three feet from the ceiling. And when that sprinkler goes off, man, it's lights out, bro. It's lights out. That smoke's all the way to the floor because of the, uh, the draft it creates and also cooling the smoke, rapidly cooling the smoke. But we, we learn that almost always, I can't think of too many exceptions where if the building is sprinklered, Let's get some lines into that uh, uh, fire department connection and uh, uh, make sure that the valves are open. Uh, it's very common for us to arrive and uh, somebody's already shut the sprinklers off. 
In other words, we'll, we'll go up to an enunciator panel and uh, there's a, uh, we responded on a water flow alarm, but yet when I look at the display on the enunciator panel, it says supervisory, tamper, sprinklers, 14th floor. Well, what happened? Well, there was a fire. If I, there's a red light illuminated, but the display says supervisory. Well, if we take a look at the scroll back in the panel, we find out that there was a fire on the 14th floor. And what happened? The maintenance man ran up there and shut the sprinklers off, therefore initiating a supervisory alarm. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I could see that people are quick to to shut that off, maybe even... Yeah, but that's that's very interesting. I like hearing about that. We got to be very careful when we shut sprinklers off, and at, at, at the at the very least, we have to keep a firefighter with a radio at those valves. I remember overhauling a uh, a warehouse one time where uh, we upset a partially uh, melted container. Uh, I can't remember what it, what it was. Some type of flammable liquid. And I think it was a printing firm. So it had to be something where they cleaned the printing presses. And this thing flared up on us and caught us with our pants down. And we, we had a huge flare up of fire. It was a flammable liquid spill uh, that we caused. And we had to turn those sprinklers back on. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting stuff. I like hearing about that. I wanted to ask you about, you know, you've talked to me a couple times a couple couple questions. You talked to me a couple times about you know your mission and kind of bridging the gap um, between fire prevention professionals and you know the fire service. So you know I'd like to hear more about that and also. Well, I'll start with that first one. There is a huge disconnect, as I mentioned, between people in your business, fire prevention people, you being a fire protection engineer fire prevention people, and fire suppression people. As I said, fire suppression people naturally don't, they're not interested in codes and dry subjects like that, suppression detection systems. Uh, I've had well-respected captains come up to me and say, hey, Bill, that's all interesting and good, but why do I need to know that? Why do you need to get your friggin' job to know that? You better know it. You better know systems. You better know codes. And you better know building construction. And uh, personally, I don't find that dry. I find it uh, fascinating. But there is a huge disconnect. A huge disconnect. Now, I can think of some terrible fires that have occurred in our history, maybe even recently, that are at least partially attributed to that disconnect and lack of communication between fire prevention people and fire suppression people. And, uh, and it goes both ways. If I am a, 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 a fire officer on an engine company and I respond to a, uh, an illegal assembly occupancy, uh, we've had this in the Miami area where because of Instagram, you'll have a, a young people, um, go into their father's warehouse or cabinet shop or whatever with a couple kegs of beer and 400 of their closest friends and be jam packed in there. And, uh, if we should arrive on a medical call and we see that as a fire officer, we have a duty to act. We have a duty to act. We have got to put an end to it. We've got to contact somebody on my department. It is the on duty investigator, fire investigator, because he's a state certified fire inspector. We have a duty to act. So don't think that fire prevention and code enforcement is not your job. It is your job if you ride that fire apparatus. That's good stuff. I, it, it's important, you know, that uh, everybody be more knowledgeable. I always, you know, I'm kind of blown away by not just, you know, uh, I'm speaking about mostly, you know, fire protection designers, fire protection engineers, uh, you know, everybody needs to, you know, we're dealing with life safety here. So I always try to encourage people to be continuously learning and continuously moving forward. So, Well, Gus, you know, I, I might make some firefighters angry, but I'm going to uh, tell the dirty little secret. Firefighters have snookered, hoodwinked the public into thinking that we can climb 50, 60 stories of stairs 
and then put a hose line into operation in a timely fashion in a good in, and in shape to fight a fire. It's not happening. In a high-rise building, a conservative estimate is one minute per floor. Fire on the 55th floor, you're only as strong as your weakest person. If we don't, if we don't, if we have to use, we can't take the elevators, we are in deep, deep trouble. On my department, I'm responsible for writing the, uh, rewriting our high-rise high SOP. There are two things, well, let, me, let me name a few, uh, where you immediately transmit a sec, uh, second alarm or an extra alarm as soon as you get on the scene. One is you got a fire on the 23rd floor and there's smoke in the stairway on the first floor. Well, how the hell did it get there? Well, that's reverse stack effect. You know, you're in Oklahoma City. You know how hot it gets in the summertime. So the air, if there's an opening up high, the air is going to cool off because of the air conditioner, and it's going to it's going to sink. So you know you're having a bad day when you got smoke on the first floor for a fire on the 23rd. So that's one thing. Immediately transmit a second line. Uh, next is if there's any fire showing upon arrival, uh, immediately transmit a second alarm. And the third is um, you can't use the elevators. Now, Gus, it's been a long time, but uh, we're starting to see now, and it's not going to happen retroactively. We have to realize that elevators are a necessity in a, in a high-rise building, not only for us to reach uh, to f the, the fire area, we take it like two or three floors below the fire. But for evacuation, I've got buildings that hardly anybody in the building is not using a wheelchair or a walker. A oh, fire alarm goes off and there's a pre-recorded uh, announcement to evacuate the building. Is that what we really want them to do? No, that's not what we want them to do. We want them to stay in the refuge of a relatively tenable compartment, compartment, condominium, hotel room, uh, apartment. Stay there, and we will protect in place. In these buildings, we have to take you. Your, your one of your questions was about occupancy. In a single-family house, we can take people away from the harm. We can cut the burglar bars off the windows, take out the windows, and we can go in and we can grab these people. We can search the interior right behind a hose line. In a large building full of old people, we have to protect life. Strategically, that's our first strategic priority. By taking the harm away from the people, that means we have to get water on that fire. So tactically, we're going to put water on the fire. Strategically, it's to protect life. It's that important. And I tell our recruits that when you are operating off of a standpipe in an occupied multiple dwelling, that, that you are conducting a, a life-saving operation as much as you are dragging granny down a smoky hallway. It's that important that you get it right. Wow. That's really interesting. You speaking about uh, high-rise high rise operations for the fire service. Yeah, I think I was watching a, a hump day hangout with you uh, talking about how you were writing the uh, operations and procedures for your department, some of the different departments, criteria you were looking at, and just how you were going through that process. And that sounds really interesting. Yeah, and it's, it's Gus, in order to control a fire in a high-rise building, you have to control its systems, sprinkler, standpipe, fire pumps, HVAC, which uh, one of the components may be a smoke management or control system. Your stairwells, your elevators, uh, standpipe and sprinkler systems, fire pumps, and your occupants. You have to control your occupants. Now, there are some departments in this country that do it right. Uh, Chicago uh, does an excellent job. I, I had uh, on the hump day a few uh, months ago, I had a, a, a friend of mine that I've been um, uh, corresponding with uh, on the Chicago Fire Department. And uh, they are there, as you as you know, it's required to have a voice control or command system. It's a PA system, but it's connected to the fire alarm system uh, to advise people. And what we want people to do, for the most part, in a residential building, is stay in place. We want them to stay in place, which is I know it goes against the grain of everything that people have ever been taught, and it's not natural. It's natural for you to want to get out of a building when somebody tells you there's a fire. But every time we have 
a fire in a high-rise building, we will find people overcome with smoke in the elevator lobby. They left their completely smoke-clear compartment on their walker or in wheelchairs, and now they're in the smoky elevator lobby desperately pressing buttons for an elevator that is not coming. Why? Because it's been recalled on phase one firefighter service. That's, yeah, I think it's really interesting point you talking about the elevators and, you know, how we need to circle the wagons on that a little bit and figure out how to make them more of a uh, life safety function and keep them active during fires. Because, you know, my mindset as somebody who's in fire prevention is, you know, immediately shunt trip the the elevators, you know, in case there's sprinkler activation and, you know, there's possibly water could get in the elevator and, you know, ruin the elevator or that's my mindset. Oh, Gus, Gus, boy, you, 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 oh man, you just, uh, you just opened up a hornet's nest there, my brother. The controversy of sprinklers in your machine room and hoistway is a, it's huge. It's huge. I don't like them. The elevator industry doesn't like them. We don't want them there. So we get in an elevator and that illuminated helmet icon starts to flash. That indicates that a smoke detector in the machine room or the hoistway has been activated. And then there's also a heat detector, which is near a sprinkler, but it'll go off faster than the sprinkler. And Gus, as you mentioned, a shunt trip, if that is initiated, you're dead in the water, bro. You're sunk. You are sunk. So there are elevators, Gus, that are, um, I cannot remember, fire service access, I believe they're called. You very see very few of them. It's in our building code now, but it's not retroactive, where you will actually have uh, an enclosed lobby with smoke barrier doors. You will have some type of of dike or drain so that water from sprinklers cannot get in the hoistway and there are no sprinklers in the the hoistway or the machine room but Mm. you know it's 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 we have to realize that elevators are a necessity and and if we're in we're in deep trouble everybody's in deep trouble occupants and firefighters if we can't take the elevators yeah definitely you know it it's something that you know an occupant evacuation elevator or you know a more stringent fire service elevator is something that a building owner from a cost perspective is going to want to avoid at all you know stances but it's something that it sounds like is absolutely critical for the fire service and you know keeping these elevators you know active and working is a huge factor yeah and here and here's another problem gus and uh i feel so far sorry for those firefighters in london they Followed their procedure at the Grenfell Towers fire where you had aluminum composite panel cladding, which is basically polyethylene plastic sandwiched between two thin sheets of aluminum. What makes it really bad is that for moisture accumulation, there is a gap. There's an airspace between the cladding and the uh, spandrel beams and columns of the building. So you have a flue. So it can burn on both sides. And they uh, initiated a protect and place strategy because that's what they did. Well, in that case, when the fire is scaling the outside of the building, there is no compartmentation. So it turned out, and in retrospect, in some in some people's opinion, that that was the wrong thing to do. And of course, they were both civilly and I believe criminally uh, prosecuted. Uh, but we just had a fire like that, and uh, I believe it was United Arab Emirates uh, about a, uh, two weeks ago. And uh, that's a whole different story when you have the fire burning on the outside on that cladding. So, and that's one case where you may have to evacuate the whole building, but it's got to, as I said, you have to control your occupants. You're going to have to have some type of controlled evacuation. It's been really interesting in all the, the trade magazines that I read, you know, talk about exterior cladding and how that's such a, a critical thing in the industry now and research and code development on limiting these materials for exterior cladding because of how impactful they can be to this fire spread 
on the exterior of the building and Grenfell Towers is just, it's been such a huge push for the industry to try to get this figured out. So it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's everywhere. People are talking about it and rightfully so. I have a good friend of mine that is a, uh, a, a captain on the Clark County Fire Department in Las Vegas, Nevada. He uh, spent most of his career on the Las Vegas Strip. They have a problem with those buildings out there is that the decorative, uh, I like to call it gingerbread on the outside of the building, uh, <laughs> around windows and uh, like a, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's like a facade. Yeah. That stuff is basically styrofoam covered with a very thin sheet of uh, some type of a plastic uh, substrate and then uh, plaster. Uh, basically, what you got is you, the, the exteriors are uh, combustible. Uh, you saw it at the, um, I'm thinking it was the Monte Carlo a few years ago. It's where you have a fa- you have a, a, a facade fire. It's not a structure fire. It's just the uh, ornamentation burning on the outside of the building. But Vincent Dunn, who I'm a huge uh, student of, he says, uh, well, no, there's actually seven sides to a fire. Okay, he says that, uh, yeah, there's four sides and there's a top and a bottom. But when you have a building within a combustible exterior, there's a seventh side, and that is the exterior. That's a side that we have to consider. Wow, I like that. That, that, puts, that puts a nice visual to it. That's, that's good stuff. So I wanted to ask you about, yeah, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is, you know, you've, you're an advocate for education and educating people in fire prevention and in the fire service. But one of the things I wanted to ask you is what kind of um, resources would you suggest for um, somebody who wants to know more about fire suppression or fire alarm? I know that you've been involved in some training videos. That's kind of where I found you. And I was learning a bunch from watching your training videos and your knowledge of fire suppression systems and standpipe systems and valving and just uh, all that's involved was very impressive. But yeah, I'd like to get your input. Oh, there's, there's great. Well, the, of course the internet, there's an abundance on the internet. I learn a lot. Just, I, I am not an employee of sprinkler Matic. Uh, however, I teach at their facility. Sprinkler Matic is a, uh, a fire suppression contractor uh, based out of uh, the Fort Lauderdale area uh, that is probably the biggest suppression contractor in the uh, in the state, St- sprinkler and standpipe systems. And their president, Robin Collier, has built the most amazing wet laboratory of just about every suppression riser imaginable at his sprinkler matic university he calls it in uh, davie florida he also has one in tampa the tampa area so uh they have an abundance of youtube videos on sprinkler system design sprinkler system operation design of what we call a manual wet standpipe system where there's water in the system uh, and it supplies the sprinklers, but not sufficient to supply a hose line. So in that case, a, uh, a fire department connection pumping that has got his, is a, is a necessity, not just a precaution. Uh, there are tremendous amount of books on, uh, alarm systems and, uh, suppression systems available. Uh, and of course there are courses. A lot of them are sanctioned by your state, your state should be, I know in the state of Florida it is, they have state uh, recommended and uh, certified classes that uh, you can take at their facility or if a a local jurisdiction meets the criteria for the course, uh, you can take it elsewhere, but uh, you have to follow their curriculum on alarm and suppression systems uh, on on building uh, construction. So there is an abundance. Oh, and I'll tell you this. I tell firefighters all the time. You have no excuse not to know suppression systems living in South Florida. Why? Because almost all of the components are naked. They're outside the building. We don't have any freezing weather. So we're looking at a detector check, a double check detector check. 
backflow preventer. We're looking at it. It's right there in the front yard. But there's there's an abundance of resource. Also, your community colleges have, that's where I, I took classes on systems. Systems one and systems two. Building construction one and building construction two. In the, commu- in the community college, I got another example. Dutchess Community College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, I have a good friend of mine that was just retired. He was the program chair. The work that those students do with controlled burns and test burns and the classes that you can take there, uh, there is no shortage of books, uh, media on the internet uh, for you to learn uh, the suppression, detection, and alarm systems in building construction for the fire service. Those are all great resources. I like hearing about that. I always try to plug for people's benefit. You know, when I'm talking to individuals who I know are knowledgeable and have a good um, finger on the pulse of the industry, I always try to get recommendations on resources and, you know, just kind of get a feel for where you think important information is coming from. I know you. I got a copy right here. International Fire Protection. You know, I send it to you free. No. Is it mostly advertisements? Yes. But what are they advertising? Extended coverage sprinklers? What is that? Well, it explains right in the advertisement. You you know, just, you know, sometimes firefighters have the attention span of a gnat. Just pick up a magazine. You know, and, and, and there's so many things that just take a few minutes to read. Uh, you know, a little bit, you know, sometimes... When you get in depth with uh, suppression systems and that, it's uh, it's like Tabasco sauce. A little bit goes a long way. So you take it in small digestible amounts. But a little bit every day, you should be studying something about something other than actually putting the wet stuff on the red stuff with a hose line as part of your, uh, as part of your, your job. It is your job. Gus, I, I bring up this question uh, when... Uh, to our officers, when I when I teach our officer development program, which is newly promoted officers, and I say, is it fair for us to ju- judge the nine brave firefighters that were killed at the Sofa Superstore in Charleston, South Carolina? Is it fair? We weren't there. We weren't there. We're in an air-conditioned classroom. Is it fair? And m- the answer to that is not only is it our f- is it fair, it is our obligation and duty as a father, as a husband, as a fire officer, as a person that's going to be leading firefighters into battle, it's not only fair, it is your responsibility to learn from fires that, thank God, you were lucky enough not to go to. Don't you think, Gus, we're those poor guys in Los Angeles, those poor guys, do we know what happened? No, not exactly. Are we going to find out what happened? Yes. And those poor guys that are burnt and in the hospital on ventilators right now? Well, if we just didn't pay attention to that and learn from what they learn about it, we'll listen to them, then they're there in vain. Let's find out what the heck happened. Every fire officer that I know that's dedicated to this job, first of all, is broken hearted to see how terribly injured these firefighters are in that horrific fire. We need to more find out more about it. I, I can tell you right now, Gus, if there's a fire in a head shop or one of these kind of stores that caters to uh, hash oil, mm-hmm. <laughs> you be, anywhere in this country today, You better believe that that department is going to be handling it a lot more cautiously since that horrible tragedy that happened over the weekend in Los Angeles. Now, were any of the mistakes made in Los Angeles? I don't know. You know, they they were caught off guard. Would would the same thing have happened to Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Department? You're damn straight we would have done the same thing. We would have done the same thing. So it's, yes, and, and we're going to, but we have to learn from these things. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you're a student of the fire service. Look at uh, industrial fire safety. Because of the Triangle Shirtwaist fire, where a bunch of immigrant girls were killed in the early 1900s, 
we change the fire codes in in, in factories. It, it's 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 tragedies like that. I love when you talk about the historic fires because you know it's so important. It, it was part of my curriculum in my degree at Oklahoma State University. Um, you know, talking about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, talking about Coconut Grove, talking about the you know Station Nightclub Fire. Um, you know, I think uh, this this uh, LA fire is even more front of mind for me because of you know the state of Oklahoma. And recently, we've had legislation pass and all of these type of shops uh, similar to the fire in L.A. pop up. And, you know, the, the building code has not caught up yet. You know, the, the wheels and the gears of the building code turn slow. And so, you know, when you have uh, dozens of these kind of shops uh, pop up and, you know, they're putting them in places and in occupancies that were traditionally business and, you know, they're having distillation processes and they have a substrate for the distillation process that can sometimes be hazardous. I mean, it's, it's very concerning. So I think that it, it is even more hits at home for me because, uh, you know, it's, it's down the street for me that these kind of hazards are, you know, being added to my community. So, yeah. And in, and in single family homes, in si- somebody in somebody's garage can have the same kind of operation. You know, yeah. you, you don't know. I mean, it's all bets are off when you're going into a single family home. Yeah. Because there's, there's no fire prevention bureau in there. No inspections. Uh, you can do man's home is his castle. He can do whatever he wants. Unfortunately, uh, firefighters get hurt and killed. And, and, and you mentioned Oklahoma State University. Uh, one of my heroes One of my heroes is John Norman. John Norman is a retired, uh, I believe he retired as a deputy from the uh, FDNY. Uh, He writes the uh, Fire Officer's Handbook of Tactics. This man, one of the reasons that he is so good at what he does, why he is such a widely respected, uh, almost worshipped educator in the fire service, is because he had a good, solid background in fire protection from Oklahoma State University. So before he was a firefighter, he was a sprinkler designer. And he mentions it several times in his uh, in his textbook. But there is a guy that has a had a well, well-rounded background in um Fire, fire protection systems. And believe me, it's one of the reasons why he's one of the superstars of the fire service. That's great. I've, I haven't heard about John Norman. John Norman is a, uh, there's a couple of people like that. Vincent Dunn, who actually was at the 23rd Street collapse. I think he was on an inspection at the time. So he didn't, he wasn't killed, obviously. He's retired now. John Norman, who ended up, one of the last things he did in his career before he left, he was in charge of the uh, uh, recovery operations uh, at 9-11 at the Ground Zero. But the man is a true, humble gentleman. But my point is this, Gus, is he knows systems. He has a firm background in systems. You cannot be an effective fire officer without a solid, solid background in fire detection, suppression systems, and building construction and codes. It's part of your job. It's not as exciting as extending a hose line under a a, a layer of smoke, but it is absolutely essential in order for you to be a well-rounded, effective, and safer fire officer. Without a doubt. So we need to connect this disconnect, Gus. We need to connect this disconnect between your folks and my folks and the fire prevention folks. We all need to be on the same page. And you know who I blame mostly? My folks, our folks. Lack of interest, they don't think it's important when it's critically important. Well, I think there's blame to go around for everyone. You know, I mean, people in my industry can be oftentimes just trying to get the job done as well. And, you know, they might not always be in the mindset of providing a, you know, fire protection and, life safety design that is, you know, uh, can be 
held up by firefighters in the fire service. You know, I've talked to people in the past, uh, Dave Stacy, uh, he was telling me about the different ways. He's a fire protection engineer and a uh, somebody who works in the fire service. And he was telling me about all the, the ways that he designs his buildings differently because he knows about the operations of the fire service, you know, industry. And, you know, so I think that it's important for both sides to try to be knowledgeable about how the other one works. And, you know, it's, it's not just the fire services fault. It's, you know, I, I'd say that it's, it's just as important for somebody who designs fire protection systems to have an understanding of, you know, uh, how the fire service works and how to make a design functional for somebody in the fire service. So I think that there's some buy-in on both sides here, but I like that sentiment a lot. All right. Let me give you an example of the disconnect between the fire suppression industry, the NFPA committees, uh, NFPA 14 for standpipes and fire suppression people. Traditionally prior to 1993 standpipe systems, as you know, each outlet would have to flow 250 gallons a minute at 65 PSI. Now, the only way you're going to have a good stream at 65 PSI residual pressure is with two and a half inch diameter hose line with an inch and an eighth or an inch and a quarter tip. Okay. But what was happening? Fire departments all over the country, including mine, we're using the same diameter hose that they would take into a single family house that would be inch and a half or inch and three quarter and connecting it up to a standpipe that was designed predicated on two and a half inch hose. Well, the systems were designed for two and a half inch hose, but the fire departments were using an inch and a half or inch and three quarter. Well, now that was one of the reasons why firefighters were killed at the one Meridian Plaza fire. And I like to quote Matt Stuckey, a uh, retired chief from Houston, nobody had a clue about pressure-reducing standpipe outlet valves. Nobody had a clue. No one. It's just that Philadelphia's luck ran out before anybody else's did. Nobody had a clue. Why? Because we weren't talking. We weren't talking. The NFPA committees didn't realize that fire departments were using undersized hose that was not designed for a 65 PSI residual pressure on the standpipe outlet. Well, what has happened since then? Well, now we've, we've, we've upped the pressure. It's, 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 it's 100. But still, you, uh, you, know, you have buildings. And then if you take a look at the intricacy of a pressure-reducing standpipe outlet or a, 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 a zone, zone isolation valve, a floor isolation valve for sprinklers, remember, these are the keep the pressure from exceeding 175 PSI for standpipe and 165 for sprinklers. The intricacies, they, they have a mind of their own. They're, they're, there's a, uh, they, the, the plunger and piston assembly that floats inside of that chamber is not connected to the valve stem. When you open up the hand wheel, that thing is going to do what it wants to do in response to uh, fluctuations in pressure downstream. I like to use the analogy Gus, that every day we uh, we exercise every valve, every drain on our fire apparatus, our fire apparatus pump. Okay, now what about that uh, that pressure reducing valve? It's a, the internal components are immersed in water. If it hasn't been tested in accordance with NFPA 25, which is the standard for testing and maintaining water-based fire suppression systems, then I can I can tell you I posed I posed a question to uh, to Zern, a design engineer at Zern, large manufacturer of pressure reducing valves. I said I'm gonna I, I don't mean to offend you. I said but uh, let me let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, I'm killed in a wind driven high rise fire and my wife sues Zern for um, a defective pressure reducing standpipe outlet valve. What would be your recourse? He says oh very simple, show me the documents show me when this system was last tested in accordance with NFPA 25. That means for pressure reducing valves, a cap test, uh, a cap, it's a valve cap test with a, with a gauge on it once a year and a full flow test at 250 gallons a minute at 100 PSI every five years. Is it being done? Well, if it's not being done in your jurisdiction, 
then when you rely on that pressure reducing valve, you are taking a leap of faith. And, and, and to all our firefighters out there, if you are not testing your standpipe systems in accordance with NFPA 25, do yourself a favor. Do not go and stretch dry to the fire floor because the door to the fire compartment is closed. No. Charge the line on the floor below so that the guy on the valve and the guy looking at the inline gauge and the guy flowing the nozzle in the stairway are in agreement. If we have a pressure problem because of lack of maintenance on the uh, pressure reducing valves or uh, some other problem, let's identify it and fix it before we go to battle. You go upstairs, sure, it takes less firefighters, but then try to communicate back on a radio or with runners. Uh, give me 20 more pounds. It's not going to happen, brothers. It's not going to happen. So I, I can't stress the importance of, I mean, you wouldn't, it would be crazy for you not to exercise and check your apparatus uh, on a periodic basis. Well, if you're not checking these systems in these buildings, you know, you're putting your life, it's literally putting your life on the line and depending upon these things. Yeah. And I, I look at firefighters, NFPA 25, what is that? They don't know. They don't have a clue. Pressure reducing valve, what's that? I don't know. They don't know. Well, we got to make it our business to know. Now, how did I learn? I didn't learn from the ranks of fire prevention or firefighting people. I learned from reaching out to uh, people in our fire prevention bureau and folks like Sprinkler Matic. I have a guy that uh, is a sprinkler and standpipe system uh, plans review, design, design reviewer uh, in our fire prevention bureau that sprung, hung sprinkler piping as a superintendent for 33 years. I don't think there's a week that goes by that I don't pick up the phone and ask him a question. I learned from those guys. Uh, can I tell you a quick story? Go for it. I'm all ears. All right. My first, my first introduction to a pressure-reducing valve. We got a building under construction, about a 12-story building, so it's not that high. And uh, come in on a, a Saturday, and there's a suppression contractor uh, putting the finishing touches on the uh, suppression system. And I said, hey, hey, before you hang the drywall, can we uh, connect some hose lines to a, an outlet and we're going uh, to pump the, uh, uh, the fire department connection. We're going to flow some water out the window. Yeah, sure. He says, and I don't know what possessed me, but maybe because I've, I have the gift of gab, which means I talk too much. I said, yeah, just so you know what we're going to do, sir, we're going to take uh, two three-inch lines and we're going to uh, connect to the fire department connection and we're going to charge it our standard starting pressure for standpipe systems at 150 PSI. Uh, he says, uh, wait a minute, that's not going to be enough. What do you mean it's not going to be enough? It's a 12-story building. 150 PSI will be fine. He comes back and he says, nope, you're going to have to pump. It hadn't been posted yet. The building's under construction. You're going to have to post 205 PSI. Oh, yeah, okay, all right, all right. Well, we pumped 150, and guess what? Egg on my face. It looked like a damn garden hose. Why? Because every valve in that building was set at the factory. These were factory set valves. For what? There were two stand, standpipes, two stairwells in this building. So you would have to, the, everything, the fire pump, the PRBs, everything is set for the pressure necessary to get 750 gallons a minute at the roof at 100 PSI. And if you're pumping the fire department connection to duplicate the action of the fire pump or fire pumps, if you're not pumping that pressure, you will have inadequate flow on your standpipe outlets. It's that important. I like that. That's good uh, practicals. You know, at, uh, pressure reducing valves can be tricky. And, there, you know, those complications that you were talking about um, extend for everybody in yeah, 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 you want to you want to learn you want to learn something you want to learn from your mistakes make an ass out of yourself in public, and then find out that you better believe I delved into this I picked this guy's brain I now on my desk I got cutaways of every major pressure reducing valve available in the country. That's great stuff. Well, Bill, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I didn't get to all my questions for you. Maybe um, I can have you back on here. Uh, and yeah, Gus. Sure. But I really appreciate you and 
And yeah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, Gus, you know, you're you're in a different uh, line of fire protection, but we are brother firefighters because you're a firefighter as well. You are a firefighter. You may never wear a breathing apparatus or go into smoke with a hose line, but what you are doing by designing systems and making sure they're installed properly, tested properly, is every bit as important to firefighting and fire protection and protection of buildings and civilians as what I used to do uh, when I was an active firefighter. So I really appreciate it, Gus, and I'm, I'm happy to participate. Well, thank you. That's, that's awesome. I appreciate that too. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to share the episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Don't forget that fire protection and life safety is serious business. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are by no means a professional consultation or a codes and standards interpretation. Be sure to contact a licensed professional if you are getting involved with fire protection and or life safety. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.